my name is Tachini Bandara, and I am an assistant professor and affiliated with the Alacrity Center for Health and Longevity in Mental Illness. Today, I'll be talking to you about how to use marginal structural models in mental health services research. First, I'd like to provide a brief introduction to our center and what we'll be talking about today. The Alacrity Center is funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, and the goal of the center is to eliminate premature mortality among people with serious mental illnesses. In my own work, I am a health policy researcher by training who is focused on evaluating policies and conducting mental health services research with the goal of increasing access to evidence-based health services for populations with mental illness. This methods workshop is part of a series put on by the center to provide introductions to innovative and useful methods to consider when studying issues related to premature mortality. Mental health services, such as the ones that we study, often require advanced statistical methods to help address issues that often present themselves in this work. These issues can include challenges like properly measuring outcomes and exposures, the inability to randomize treatments, interventions, and policy solutions, and accounting for the complex health and social systems within which mental health services are delivered and within which people with serious mental illness interact. Our hope with this workshop series is that we can highlight some advanced quantitative methods to help you answer some of the important questions around mental health services research that you're interested in doing. Today, I will be talking specifically about one type of method, marginal structural modeling, and its application in mental health services research. This is a method that is drawn from the epidemiology literature and can be useful in evaluating policies, interventions, and treatments that vary over time or are susceptible to time varying confounding. I'll discuss exactly what this means next. So what do I mean by time varying treatments and time varying confounding? In very simple cases, we often study the effect of a treatment or a policy that's administered at a very particular point in time, a single point in time. So it's really easy for us to specify covariates that are measured before the treatment and policy is applied, and then an outcome that's measured after the treatment and policy is applied. Now, what happens if we have a treatment and covariates that are repeatedly measured over time? And what happens if people start treatments at different time points? Or in the case of a policy evaluation, what happens if a policy is rolled out over time with different organizations taking up that policy at different times? Similarly, what do we do if a person's involvement in treatment can change over time? For example, think of a drug or a medication or a therapy that people might enter and leave depending on a certain health marker. In other words, these are all situations when a person's exposure to treatment can vary over time. Now, you can also imagine that there are covariates that influence when someone is enrolled in treatment or when they're exposed to a policy, and that these covariates can also change over time. So, for example, let's think about a health indicator like hemoglobin A1c, which is a marker for blood sugar in a diabetic. We can imagine that someone's hemoglobin A1c can be measured over multiple times over a time period. And depending on what their hemoglobin A1c level is, that could determine whether or not they're started on a drug to help control their diabetes. Then we could also imagine that that drug could affect their hemoglobin A1c in future measurements by, say, reducing it. Then we could imagine that that reduced level of hemoglobin A1c could subsequently affect their treatment use in the future, potentially by having a reduced hemoglobin A1c, then the amount of medication they're used is reduced. So in these kinds of situations where we have covariates that are changing over time, treatments that are changing over time, this introduces an added complication to how we analyze and evaluate these types of treatments and policies. We know from previous research that if we just use traditional regression adjustment, that this could lead to bias in our effect estimates and our results. It may even mask the existing effects of treatments and policies. One way to deal with this time varying treatment and time varying confounding is to use marginal structural models. To understand marginal structural models, let's think of first of a randomized experiment where there are multiple time points in which a person can be randomized to treatment. 
at each time point, there are a set of covariates that we want to control for that may influence differences between the treatment and control group. By randomizing treatment at each time point, we're ensuring balance between the treatment and control group of these covariates. Now what happens when we can't randomize? Marginal structural models uses weighting to approximate this experiment. What it essentially does is that at each time point, it creates a pseudo sample where there's no relationship between confounders and treatment. And in doing so, then you don't have to control for these covariates in the regression model. I should note that marginal structural models can also be used in cases of randomized control trials. For example, they're used to evaluate the impact of adherence to assigned treatment on outcomes. But the application of this method that we're talking about today is focused on the case where we're using observational data and using the marginal structural model to mimic a sequential randomization or randomization to treatment at various time points.